All right. I believe we are finally live here. Good after, good evening, I should say, uh, everyone. Uh, this is Rob Orson with the Emerging Revolutionary War. Um, we are shifting gears tonight to talk uh, to an author, one of our good friends, Eric Sterner, who has a brand new book out um, that we'll be getting, diving into here shortly. I'm also joined by Mark Malloy, who's got the, the monument there behind him. Mark, good pull there on the backdrop. Nice. <laughs> Um, as always, um, you know, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. We will, Mark and I will keep an eye on the chat here as we, as we go along. Uh, also, you know, first I want to thank Eric for being here tonight. Eric is an author for Journal of the American Revolution, also with us, Emerging Revolutionary War. Um, Eric has a fascinating life outside of history. I won't even get into that, but he has a pretty cool job. But tonight we'll focus on, on his love of history. And my first question, Eric, is how do you say the name of the town? <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. My high, school, uh, my high school German said one way. The locals pronounce it another way. Right. Most people who talk about it pronounce it a third way. And uh, they all forget that we're really talking about it with a Moravian accent in German. So don't even try. Right. Yeah. I was talking to Phil Greenwald uh, last week about this, and he said he. He thought he pronounced it correctly to someone who was from near there. And they said, no, you got that all wrong. The G is not silent at all. That You have to say the G. <laughs> yeah. Just Nadden Hutton. So I started. Nadden Hutton. <laughs> almost. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Nadden Hutton. Nadden Hutton. All right. So for those who are just joining us, the, the book is a, a Anatomy of a Massacre, the Destruction of Naden Hutton. Um, took place uh, March of, in 1782. It's, it's a much kind of overlooked. I didn't know much about it until Eric started working on this project. It's a fascinating story. So to kind of get us started here, Eric, give us a little bit of a background of, of what this massacre was and, and, and how it developed and how it took place. Uh, well, throughout the, around around 1770, you started had this group of uh, folks from Moravia, which is an Austro-Hungarian empire, and they've been migrating into the, to the colonies for decades. Um, and they were an externally focused church. They became known as Moravians for the part of Austria, Hungary, they were from, it's just near Prague. Um, and they sent a lot of missionaries everywhere. These guys had a facility with languages, they had a structure for it. So they did a ton of missionary work. They started out with the Iroquois, didn't have a lot of luck, but they found some success with the Delaware, with the Mohican, um, some of the other tribes up in New England or New York, Connecticut. And as they got pushed out through the French and Indian War, um, the Moravians sort of followed them. So the Delaware ended up moving west out of Pennsylvania. They ended up in the Muskingum River Valley, uh, which is in uh, Eastern Ohio. The Moravians settled some of their um, mission towns there. And the first one was a place called New Schoenbrunn. Second one was a place called uh, Madden Hutton. Third was Lichtenau. Fourth was a place called Salem. And they moved around amongst these towns as the war changed. Uh, but in these towns, you had Christian converts, so they were various Indian, various Native Americans from various tribes, um, but they were there in the Muskingum River Valley under the protection of the Delaware Nation. As the revolution unfolds, the Delaware start to split with some falling into the British camp, some more inclined towards the Americans. And when the Delaware finally split and joined the British, um, that blanket of protection disappears from those Moravian villages. Um, fall of 1781, the Native Americans from the western areas of Ohio, so these are Wyandotte, um, Ottawa, and so on, show up and say, you're coming with us. And they actually take these Christian Indians, put them on a reservation in western Ohio. There's no food on this reservation in western Ohio. This is sort of becomes a common story in Native American life, right? So they go east back to their old villages to try and recover some of the stuff that they left behind. And while they're there, uh, gathering supplies to try and tide them over uh, in March 1782, um, some groups of settlers, probably about 150, 160 uh, from Western Pennsylvania, right out there, um, capture the, the, the foraging groups in two towns, Madden Hutton and Salem. And 
kill them all in cold blood. And then the settlers go back to Ohio, go back to Pennsylvania, give themselves a pat on the back, find out that the local opinion is mixed. And they decide, let's go uh, have another campaign. And they decide to go march to Western Ohio uh, where they get clobbered uh, on the Sandusky River. Mm -hmm. So the book primarily deals with that experience that brought all these um, missionaries and Indians to the Muskingum River Valley. Um, what got them there um, and then the event itself. I tried to take um, sort of three different perspectives. Started with the missionaries. So you follow that, that, that movement of missionaries and their flocks west. Uh, the second one, the second chapter really focuses on the Delaware nation itself, which threw this blanket of protection over the, the missions um, and how the changing situation of the frontier really affected them and the choices they had to make and why they started to split. The next chapter looks at um, the settlers. I mean, these guys didn't just wake up one morning, decide to go kill a bunch of Indians. They, they, there were their experience through 30 years of unrelenting warfare was pretty brutal themselves and it developed they developed kind of an attitude about how to solve their security problem last chapter deals with the actual events leading up to the, the massacre. So, talk about that experience so from what i understand the you know the, the indians at nat hutton believe that they had i guess i'm not gonna say a treaty but believe that the americans that they were under protection of them correct is that am i saying that wrong or at the, from from what i've read it's like they they've didn't really expect this to happen, obviously, but didn't expect that someone that they thought were friendly, quote unquote friendly, was going to be the ones that would would do something like this. They're in this really uh, weird situation where they're in, they're 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 in no man's land on the Muskingum. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the reason that the mission communities ended up in Ohio, uh, they've been persecuted. Um, all the way from Eastern Pennsylvania and Northern Pennsylvania, and they left. And they were fleeing, in a lot of ways, white persecution. And you gotta think about it, the United Brethren Church, uh, the faith that they practice a little different mm -hmm. than the Church of England or the Methodists or the Presbyterians and Scots, the Presbyterianism that the Scots-Irish practiced. Um, so they didn't quite fit in and they had a very independent streak when it came to not owing political allegiance to anyone. Um, you toss in the, the sort of the racial animus um, and just plain old racism. And these mission communities were not safe in the East. During the French and Indian War, they found themselves in the middle again because the missionaries and you know, their congregants, they still got family on the other side of the, the war and they're interacting. So they're, they're held under suspicion by a lot of the whites and, and in that case, um, Pennsylvania and, and British authorities. Um, what you had was the governments tried to protect them and in part because they were Christian and in the Ohio, on the Ohio, in part because um, they were a rather large population of uncommitted people, meaning they were also a manpower reserve so Continental Congress authorities paying attention, guys like George Morgan, agent in Pittsburgh, do not want either the Delaware or just as important the Moravians to split with the Americans and join the British because it's a large manpower reserve. Mm -hmm. um, for their part, the British and the Native Americans do want that manpower, but they got to get rid of the missionaries themselves. Um, so they're kind of caught in the middle and to try and deal with that, they're appeasing both sides. It fits in with sort of a pacifist approach. You know, you feed the Indian warriors coming through to raid frontier settlements and attack the Americans. And then you provide Ameri intelligence to the Americans that these raiding parties are coming at you. Um, so for a lot of the Americans and the frontier settlers, it looked like duplicity. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of was, but it shouldn't have been understood in that way. It should have been understood as an attempt to remain neutral. I think I think it's really uh, interesting that you mentioned the uh, the brethren too, and the um, from my studies of the American Civil War during the uh, um, during the war there, they attempted to try and maintain this kind of neutrality, and similarly were abused by both sides. I feel like throughout the war, 
Um, but it's interesting. So in, in this particular case, um, now you mentioned that they go in and, and, and they end up killing all the people. But from what I've read, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that they, it wasn't an act of passion that they took their time uh, and they waited and they had a vote about it and decided. Um, I guess, do you know what went in through their deliberations as to why they decided such a harsh treatment for, as you said, people that, you know, were perhaps viewed as duplicitous, but not necessarily outright hostiles? Right. Um... What I tried to piece together in the book was try to get a handle on so how how um, how conscious of a decision was this? A lot of times it gets passed off uh, and glossed over as you know this just this uh, riot of of racial homicide, mass massacre, you know, um, and it wasn't that. I argue in the book that when the Pennsylvanians left Pennsylvania, they had already decided that they were going to wipe these people out. Uh, they would viewed the villages on the Muskingum as a threat for some years. They had asked continental authorities to deal with it. Continental authorities had declined to deal with it. And they came to the point that by 1781, they specifically viewed those villages as a problem. Um, not just because they were feeding war parties coming through, but because in all likelihood, the Western nations were recruiting people to go on raids with them as they passed through the towns. Uh, the, the missionaries uh, lost the ability to control access to the towns. They, they had a rule you couldn't live among the, converge, the converted group without permission. And you had to agree to all these terms if you were gonna live with them and they lost the ability to enforce those rules as the war progressed. And uh, so 1781, um, Daniel Broadhead conducted a campaign against the Delaware right after the Delaware basically decided that uh, we're gonna join the British. And during the course of that campaign, um, he had to rely on militia because there weren't that many continentals in the West. And uh, a company of militia basically said that, you know, let's go up and let's wipe out these towns now. And they were ready to go. And you have this confrontation between uh, Colonel Broadhead, uh, one company of, of American Continentals, um, one company of militia, these are run by David Shepard, and another company of sort of unnamed um, Pennsylvanians making this argument, let's go attack them. And Shepard and Broadhead faced them down. So they had a near mutiny. And basically Broadhead had to threaten the, this, these potentially mutinous uh, settler folks, militia with, you know, I'll hang you or I'll shoot you right here. And since he outnumbered them, they went along with it and they went off and finished, went off to the place called nowadays it's Kashokton in the Muslim Kingdom. So in that case, they spared the, um, the Moravian towns. Then in November 1781, uh, they'd heard people were filtering back to the towns. This is after uh, they'd been removed, but they'd been filtering back to try and recover some food. And the militia, the sanctioned mission, went out uh, to put a stop to it. Uh, they rounded a bunch of people up and they removed them to Pittsburgh. And the commander of that, episode, that, that expedition was a guy named David Williamson, who's in the 8th Pennsylvania militia. And uh, he really got the, the crap. <laughs> People were talking about behind him, talking about him behind his back and condemning his behavior and sort of striking these, striking these folks, bringing them back to militia because the Continentals got them. said, wow, that's great. Can't prove they did anything wrong. In fact, we know a lot of these guys have helped us. So we let them go. So in 1782, when they got together, um, they decided not to do it, I argue, as a sanctioned activity. They decided to do this off the books. So this wasn't a militia action, which it sometimes gets called, which I called it in my first article. Um, I, was, I think I was wrong. Um, uh, these are folks who are going without sanctions. So to, they didn't want the restraints that the Continentals had placed on them before. They didn't want to have another mission like Williamson's where they went to all this effort, 
grabbed all these folks, brought them back, and the Continentals let them go. So I think they had decided to eliminate this problem as they saw it, um, it which tells me that they had decided that death was going to happen. Now, Williamson gets his guys outside and then hunting, and he has a meeting. Um, and they plan to go occupy the town. So they go and occupy Ned and Hutton and bringing folks from Salem up. And there's this great scene, which gets, gets, gets discussed quite a bit where he puts everybody in a line. says, okay, what's the, what's, what are we going to do? Is, and he's talking about sentencing now. He's not talking about guilt. They've already decided that. And they have this sort of mob trial. Um, but he says, now we're going to pass sentence. And, and those of you who favor mercy, step forward. Um, mercy being removal to Pittsburgh. And he only gets about 18 people out of 160. Um, I, I, I kind of ask in the book, sort of, what if he'd flipped it around and asked those of you who favor death step forward, he might have gotten a different vote count. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so that's not enough. And the sentence is death. And the real debate that occurs after that is how are we going to do it? Um, they talk about just sort of scalping them uh, and some, they're already tied up and in cabins and said, so, well, let's just burn them alive. So to split the difference, they decided to do both. Um, and what they do is they either go into the cabins and beat people to death, um, or they remove a few of them from the cabins, beat them to death, then go back in the cabins and, and kill the rest. And then they burn the houses and down around them. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, as massacres go, it's one of the most brutal things that, that, uh, Think happened during the war. How many uh, militiamen were part of this force and how many did they kill? You see numbers ranging from 80 to 160. I inclined towards 160. Uh, was about the size of a battalion. Um, uh, most of these guys were in the militia. They had probably deployed and worked together as the militia called up. Again, and they, I can't find the evidence that they were called up for this event. Um, which is why I think they had basically decided to do it off book. Hmm. So you've got probably around 160. Uh, the number of people they killed varies. Um, popular number is 96. Hmm. Uh, I think you can say more than 90. And it was basically one third men, one third women, one third children. Um, so two thirds of the people and the victims were not in any way, shape or form. It wasn't plausible that they, they, in raided any cabins or anything like that. They were just innocent women and children. I suspect most of the men were innocent too. Um, whereas the popular story is that they were all innocent. I think there is a little bit of evidence that at least made me go, it's plausible that some of these guys uh, were engaged in raiding the frontier. Um, and killing innocent men and women and children uh, in their houses, um, which is the way the Indians made the warfare uh, on the frontier. And I talk about that sort of that discussion in the book. That's that's part of that last chapter, trying to figure out how innocent people were. Gabe, one of our good friends here from who runs a, the Eighth Virginia blog, uh, asked a question here: If the massacre was locals taking matters into their own hands because of leadership failures. Which political and or military leaders are most culpable, in your opinion? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Williamson always gets the blame. Um, uh, he probably deserves it. Um, he was elected at the beginning of this, of this particular deployment. Um, he was a lieutenant colonel, the chief operational guy for a particular battalion in the Pennsylvania militia. There was no need to elect him if it was a purposeful or conscious militia action. Um, so he gets all the blame. Um, I, I don't think that's fair. After the war, you had this, this diversity of opinion among whites in the Western Pennsylvania and, and Northern, well, that part of Virginia back then. Um, as to whether this was a good thing or a bad thing. And Williamson sort of took the view uh, as he related to some first generation of historians that, look, we did what we had to do. Um, it's a terrible thing, but war is a terrible thing. And you got to understand the way that um, 
we had been suffering for so long and the blame we had and attached to the people that were killed. So he's the only name who gets named. Now there have some been some really good efforts to identify um, uh, members of the militia from that area and odds are good that a good number of them participated in the raid. Um, but he, he's the most immediately culpable. Uh, I think there is some responsibility that lies with um, the Continental Congress for failure to provide security across uh, the frontier. Pennsylvania owns a lot of that um, because they never really met their obligations in the Western Pennsylvania. Virginia tried to, but their focus shifted to Kentucky. So, because uh, they had claimed to Southwestern Pennsylvania as well. Um, so maybe we let them off the hook. I don't know. Um, I hate to say this, um, but at the end of the book, it's, it's uh, I think David Zeisberger and John Heckewelder. Uh, David Zeisberger was the chief missionary um, uh, among the Indians uh, living in this kingdom. He was an extraordinarily talented guy, uh, an extraordinary politician, extraordinary diplomat, and somebody that you can't help but admire. But he persisted in the notion much too long that he and his flock could remain safe in the middle of a war zone in which uh, just plain old racial hatred and animosity, and this is a brutal war, were going at full bore. And, and, and it occurs to him that he thinks he can stay there and not lead his folks to one side or the other. Uh, he probably should have taken them to Pittsburgh. Now, they weren't safe at Pittsburgh either. Um, the Continental Authorities at Pittsburgh kept asking them, move to Pittsburgh, I can protect you. But the truth is that the officers at Pittsburgh, when you get a series of officers there, really had no ability to protect them. Um, shortly after the massacre, some of the likely participants went on to McKees Island, south of Pittsburgh, where some of the Delaware lived, the pro-American Delaware, um, and chased, killed a few of them and chased them into the fort. Um, and then they threatened to kill John Gibson, uh, the colonel, um, who actually was in command of the fort because he harbored the Indians. Um, so I can understand Zeisberger's decision from that standpoint, Pittsburgh not being safe, but um, I have a hard time believing that, that he made the right decision in remaining where he was. Now, he was the missionary leader. There were several senior Indians among that group. They had been converted. Uh, they held senior positions within the church, in the mission towns. Uh, one of them was a guy named Glickican, who was baptized, baptismal name was Isaac. Extraordinarily influential guy. Um, he could have probably been more assertive in getting people moved away from this danger area, dangerous area. Um, there's plenty of, of blame to go around. If you, if you want to deal with immediate massacre itself, it's David Williamson. No denying it. But I think there are a whole lot of other folks who um, could have made different decisions to avoid this thing. I got a question. Yeah, you mentioned that the militiamen were, uh, or I guess the vigilantes whatever they were <laughs> the settlers <laughs> the vigilantes uh, uh, oh, raiders, I think. raiders yeah um uh you mentioned that they were talking about scalping is now i usually consider that as what native americans would do is that something that settlers were doing at that time oh yeah really yeah. interesting um settlers have been scalping indians for decades really um, it was how you fought the war. Uh, the French Indian War, Pennsylvania offered, scal off Pennsylvania offered cash scalp bounties for Indians. Um, and you get this weird situation where uh, Colonel Broadhead's in command at, at Fort Pitt. He's been pressed to bring in an army into the Delaware to protect the Delaware. Uh, he can't do it, he doesn't have the resources. Pennsylvania's solution to the problem is to offer scalp bounties for Indians that are raiding across, you know, these are, that are raiding across the, the, the Ohio. Uh, Broadhead actually has to ask the Delaware, he said, look, stay away from white people. They're gonna scalp you for the money that Pennsylvania is offering on your scalps. 
um, you might want to consider intercepting some of these raiding parties coming out of Western Ohio and taking their scalps and getting paid for it. I, I mean, what is up with that, right? <laughs> Um, but scalping was a practice that went both ways. Interesting. Um, and then my other question is, you know, with all this going on, you know, just in the broader context, you know, this is, we were just down in Yorktown, you know, uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, so this is after Yorktown, I guess, from the continental perspective, or even the British perspective, how did either side view this incident that happened? Uh, and was there any sort of reactions or did it, you know, affect largely any of the, the, the politics of the, the war at that point? Um, one of the quotes I use in some of the promotional material, the letter from Benjamin Franklin to a, a friend in Britain, and he's appalled. Um, most of the folks, I think, on the eastern seaboard are appalled. Um, uh, in Western Pennsylvania, you get a mixed reaction. Um, a lot of the folks there are like, you know, good for you. Uh, we've suffered enough. This is a problem fixed. Um, good for you. <laughs> Keep at it. Um, there are a fair number of leaders in the West who are also appalled and outraged. These are largely the Westmoreland County which is north of Pittsburgh, and um, they're, they're stunned. Um, and they're sending letters to the East saying, you know, don't, don't mistake this for something we support. Um, this is horrible to us, and it's horrible to us. It's morally offensive. Um, and for the second reason is that if word, when word gets of this event gets around, the British and the Indians are going to use it as justification to treat us worse. Uh, there was a propaganda battle between the Americans and the British about you know, Indian warfare. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what happens is when the Indians uh, deal with um, <clears throat> a follow-up campaign by the militia, uh, they catch quite a few people and put them to death in some horrible, horrible ways. Uh, I wrote about those on the blog. Um, so you get to the point where Everybody's writing, this is crossing a line to, this is a line that should not have been crossed. Um, I think politic, public opinion in the West starts to accept that this was a line that should not have been crossed, particularly as they learn more about uh, the number of women and children killed. Um, and General William Irvine, who takes over at Fort Pitt, um, goes to some lengths to make sure it doesn't happen again, although he hasn't really got real muscle or power to prevent it from happening again. Um, but he tries to make it real clear that it, it cannot happen again, which was a real possibility. So what were the repercussions as far as, um, you know, obviously there's going to be a response to this. And, uh, you know, I've read briefly about, you know, William Crawford and his situation in Sandusky, you know, his death. Is that a direct result of what happens here among many other incidents or do, do, do natives take a, kind of a revenge streak and, and seek out, you know, some of these people that, that did this? Um, Crawford campaign is an immediate follow-up. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of these guys go back to Western Pennsylvania and say, look what we did, isn't that great? We need to keep pushing the advantage because they think they've scored this great victory. Um, and so they get up a, a campaign uh, led by William Crawford. It's called Crawford's Campaign nowadays, uh, which we wrote about in, in the blog. And, and uh, they head west to Western Sandusky, um, where it is generally the home of the Wyandotte, which is some of the most aggressive warriors in Western Ohio. Um, they're, uh, they're, they also happen to be the guys who took the initiative in removing the Moravians to Western Ohio in the first place, um, and then starving them to death, which is what put them back on the Muskingum. Um, the Americans get beat out on the Western Sandusky, as I mentioned, um, the Wyandotte and some of the other folk, other nations out there catch a lot of Americans and put them to death in really horrible ways. So you're getting this escalation of violence and it's already a pretty brutal situation. Um, and after word of Crawford's execution, which is horrific, uh, written about it on the blog, so go read the blog, um, spreads, 
the, the an exchange of letters between officers in Detroit and some of the Americans saying, "We got this is getting out of hand. We gotta we gotta stop this." Uh, ironically, Washington's reaction uh, to Crawford's death is, uh, "It's a war to the death now. Forget it. All all bets are off. Uh, you go out west, you're on your own, um, and it's expect no quarter." So this is not, we're not gonna have any pretense of a civilized war uh, in the West anymore. Um, I think he was just acknowledging what was already happening at that point. Um, it does seem to get brought under control as the British start to, you know, the war ends. I mean, this is after Yorktown. Uh, so the British start to see less and less support out to the, in the West. Um, and the Indians sort of have to put up with for a time, the, the Treaty of Paris and the consequences of that. So the raiding continues back and forth. It's not as intense. You don't get these big campaigns until um, fallen timbers again. Mm -hmm. no, first, the Northwestern. Sorry. So, so a little bit about you. So what, what drew you to this story, right? So it's such a, it is an interesting story. And it's, it's one of many of, of these, you know, frontier kind of escalating um, affairs, as you said. So what drew you to this particular topic? Okay, here's the irony. I was starting to dig into George Rogers Clark. Mm -hmm. This is about three or four years ago. And I came across an account of the torture and execution of William Crawford uh. by an observer, the guy who was there and, you know, next on the hit list, he managed to escape. Um, so wanted to know what the heck was this guy doing in Western Ohio being executed or in this horrific fashion. So that led to uh, a lot of research in the Crawford campaign, which we serialized. And it all came back to uh, the pretty good consensus that this was the Native Americans retaliating for the massacre at Naden Hutton. So that, okay, you know, light bulb, what happened at Naden Hutton? And that's what got me into that. Um, and once you start digging into that, you learn about the Moravians and, and uh, sort of their uh, breadth of work on the, on the frontier. Um, and you go, this is a fascinating story. And, and that's what led to the book. So we have a question here. Um, see here. Uh, did the massacre have an effect on Christian mission work on the frontier, specifically mission work with Native Americans? I'm not the right person to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was kind of a hard question, but I figured I'd, I'd share it. <laughs> it had to. The the I, I can I can say this that um, uh, the Moravian mission um, on the Muskingum and to those particular congregations obviously took a big hit. Now the Moravians had 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 generally had a lot of success when they got removed and put on the reservation in Western Ohio. Um, they were there for a time. The British decided that we really do need to separate the, the missionaries from their flocks because we're convinced and the Indians, the Wyandot, and some of the Delaware who are now on our side are convinced that those missionaries are the chief obstacle to giving us access to this manpower. Um, so they forcibly, they just summon, they tell, they, they tell the missionaries, you're, you're coming to Detroit and they're going to stay there. So that separates the missionaries from congregations and in some cases have been together for 30 years since before the French and Indian War. Um, so that starts to fall apart in a pretty big way. Um, they're still under threat um, uh, throughout this period. Uh, the, the, rent, the, the guy named DePeister, who, or DePeister, who is the uh, commandant at Detroit, eventually finds them some land with a relatively safe north of Detroit. Um, and you have a small mission established there uh, for kind of the survivors and, and the folks who hadn't decided to go back to their older ways. Um, and that lasts for a little while, but doesn't succeed very well. Um, after the war, um, the, the Confederation Congress says, okay, uh, this is terrible. We, 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 need, we, we owe some amends here. And they try to give um, some of the land on the Muskingum back to the Moravian Church. Uh, for use in missions, and Zeisberger and Heckewelder give it a, give it another go, and but by then too many whites have moved in. Um, it's not this; they can't have this isolated, idyllic, Christian life that they want. Um, that falls apart pretty quickly, 
Um, and eventually that, that area is ceded back to the United States. Uh, there's a small area that the church has, uh, and a beautiful church in the town of Manhattan, which unfortunately I didn't actually go in when I was visiting the town. Um, um, so yeah, this little chapter um, died off. Zeisenberg, Zeisberger lived for quite a while, Heckewelder lived for quite a while, and they stayed in Ohio for the most part. Zeisberger buried there. Uh, Heckewelder, I think, went back to Pennsylvania. Uh, he was buried somewhere in Pennsylvania. I should know, but I don't. Uh, what, what was the like uh, historiography of this? I mean, was there much written about this following the war um, or, you know? because it's a chapter of the war you, I guess like you mentioned I've read about Crawford's execution and knew about some of these stories but I never had heard of this particular massacre um and so I just don't know if it was something that wasn't written much about or is there you know a body of work about it that I just am unaware of it, it everybody knew about it uh that first generation historians um in, West, in Eastern Ohio and, and the northern the Panhandle area of West Virginia, Southwestern Pennsylvania, knew about it. They tried to document it. And that's where you get a lot of the information um, about the, ad, the local attitudes afterwards. Um, it's, it's very scattershot. It's all you know, recorded family stories and things of that nature. Um, and again, the attitudes in a lot of those are where you know, we did what we did. It had to be done. Um, so, American historians didn't talk about the whys, the where-alls, and the hows of it. By the early 19th century, what you really have is this is, is this consensus that it was a horrible thing, it was a tragedy, it was unacceptable, shouldn't happen again. And we owe um, it to the memory of the people who died um, some sort of, of recognition. And actually, the monument behind you, uh, it took them a while to get that thing built, but that was largely done by locals uh, by subscription. Um, so that first generation, they don't talk about the specifics of it. Um, and then it sort of disappears. It shows up again in the late 1800s as, as part of these frontier histories. There were a lot of popular county histories and frontier histories published. Um, I think there was probably a commercial company, well, obviously, a, comp a publisher that decided, you know, we can stamp out county histories left and right, and they did. And you can almost find one for every county that existed um, in, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana. Uh, and they told the story there, but they're, they're thinly sourced. And so how much is storytelling and how much is, is actual history is, uh, is hard to tell. Um, they rely pretty heavily on that first generation of historians, which glossed over the thing. And then the 20th century gets rediscovered, uh, but it's rediscovered as, as sort of this, this instance of just horrible, you know, land hungry, greedy, racist white settlers killing these Indians because they wanted their land. Um, and that, that important part about the Native Americans in the West basically forcing these guys to live on a reservation against their will uh, gets forgotten completely. Um, the sources I use are a guy named uh, David Zeisberg, kept pretty copious diaries, and then John Heckelwelder, um, uh, who wrote a narrative of the missions. Uh, they covered it in pretty good detail, but they only had the story second and third hand from some observers uh, and, and victims that I talked about. They really didn't have the American side. And I can't prove it, but I think the church tried to build it up as this episode of martyrdom. Um, and you see this theme through the late 1800s and the early 1900s of martyrdom. By the 20th century, by the 21st century, some of the recent books have covered it. Um, we're still stuck with this um, horrible instance of, of white racist attacks on Native Americans. Uh, it was that, but it was more complex, and then it's done in a paragraph or two, um, and we move on. And that's part of what got me looking at it. It's like it's got to be more detailed than that. That there's got to be something else that was going on here. Um, you know, there were plenty of other places to raid and massacre people if that's what was at stake. Um, 
and I didn't quite buy the land hungry piece. Americans were, frontier settlers were, to be sure, but there were other places to go <laughs> if they wanted land. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, after the war, the Confederation Congress said, well, we're gonna give this to you, it's your land. Um, why do that if, if the old thing was a part of continuity of American policy? So uh, I, I just thought there's more complexity to it, which is why I started digging into it. And I, this is hopefully the last iteration of, of history that we'll have. <laughs> going to be the definitive book, right? There you go. Well, <laughs> <that's> wrong. <laughs> You kind of touched this a little bit. So and um, we talked about this before we went live. What what part of your research kind of um, either shocked you, you didn't expect, you know, a lot of us historians, you know, we get in interested in a topic and we think we know what we know. And then we research and we're like, oh, wow, this just kind of surprised me. Was there anything like that in your research for this book that kind of popped out at you as a aha moment or something you didn't expect? Um. The, the decision by the, the Western um, the Western tribes to forcibly relocate um, the Moravian communities to the West to move them from Muskingum, Muskingum to the Sandusky uh, that 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 sort of set me off. Okay, there's something else going. When I learned about that the first time, it was like okay, something else is going on here. Why would they do that? And that's when I put on my political science hat and got, and the book gets into a little bit. This is an uncommitted reserve of manpower. Um, and that's what's really going on here. You've got a battle between leaders of the Western tribes, guys like Dunkwater, the Wyandotte, Opican, who's Captain Pipe of, of the Delaware. Um, and the missionaries are in this tug of war over these, these people. Uh, it's a tug of war over wanting people recruits for the war. Uh, in the Western Indian case, they want, they want warriors. And in the missionaries case, they want, you know, members of their congregation. Uh, so that, that sort of set off a strategic light bulb that I hadn't really thought about or, or given much thought to before I got into the research. Um, that was the biggest one by far. Uh, a couple of the other ones where I didn't understand the complexity of, of white politics on the frontier, um, where you see real efforts by uh, continental officers and officials uh, to work with the missionaries to keep these people neutral, to protect them when they can, um, and to provide them some sort of, of haven, whether it's on the Muskingum or, or in Pittsburgh, to practice their faith and live as they wanted to live. Um, I was overwhelmed, obviously, by by the majority of folks uh, who lived on the frontier and had different ideas. So, um, uh, oh, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask. Uh, well, because and we're always very interested in the actual sites of where things happen. Is mm -hmm. what uh, what what happened to the site and what is there today? I mean, I got the monument that I found online. I've never actually been there, um, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, well, obviously there's a monument. What else uh, can you tell us about the site, I guess? Um, it's a beautiful, uh, right now it's a cemetery. Uh, there is a mass grave there. Um, what happened was uh, all these bodies were, were basically left where they, where they died. Uh, for, in many mm -hmm. cases on the ground, so animals got at them, they were exposed to the elements. Um, in other cases, um, uh, the remains were left in these burned down houses, so nothing but ash left, and there were no substantial remains to recover. Um, when Williamson's group passed through, uh, you know, some of the people of, in his, or when the Crawford's campaign passed through a few months later, uh, they, they remarked that you can see ashes and skulls and bones every here and there. So everything's mixed up and jumbled together. Uh, Heck Welder goes back after the war and after some of the land claims are settled and he tries to collect all the, the, the bodies or body parts that he can find. And again, these are gonna be a lot of bone, bone fragments uh, and bury them together in this mass grave, which, which is there. That eventually gets, I think, removed and reinterred. So they're just this mound with a sign on it. Uh, the city uh, set up or the village when it was created set up a, a, a public cemetery or some form of cemetery and it's this very large um, area now it's wooded 
but it's a cemetery, so it's cleared out, and, and it's actually peaceful in the way a lot of cemeteries are. It's not, it's well set off from the town. Um, there's a small museum, there's the monument. Um, they set up some walkways at one point that laid out the village as best they could. Uh, I think those are kind of hard to see now. Um, and they built reconstructions of two of the buildings. Um, one of them is Cooper's house which is where a lot of the uh, murders were said to have occurred. And the other one is the chapel. Um, both buildings were built by hand um, using uh, period techniques. Now the, there's a different, when you look at them, they're, they're done in different ways. Um, so one of them's not accurate. And that's probably the, 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 uh, the church. So you go now, it's, it's rather peaceful. The, the museum is sort of open intermittently. Uh, but they're very helpful. There's a sign on the thing. If you want to come in, call us. And they actually show up. <laughs> uh, we, I showed up on July 4th. It wasn't July 4th. It was like the 6th. They were having their, their, their holiday, their July 4th parade. So I interrupted that. I, I bugged some poor woman who was trying to watch the parade. Where do I find the museum? Um, and she called another guy over. And, and I went out and found it with my, with my family. And... Um, uh, it, it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful little area. I, I would say the town, which is is, resp is taking responsibility for it, has done a wonderful job trying to preserve it, the place, the site, and the memory um, in that museum. And, and the museum's grown a little bit, so it's more it's more than just the the, the mission town and the, the massacre. It, there's a lot about frontier life and, and first settlers in the area and sort of Native American life along this kingdom. So it's a really neat museum. So if, if people want to get copies of this book, which I highly recommend, I've read, like I said, I've read the manuscript. It's great. I'm waiting on my copy right now, but I'm assuming it's on Amazon. Any place else? Uh, Barnes and Noble list, lists it. Um, you can buy it from the publisher, West Holm Publishing. It does exist. Here's my heart. <laughs> okay. um, <clears throat> I, I think COVID has slowed down some shipping. Uh, mm -hmm. but the computer has, has it and has slowly been shipping things out. Uh, so I know some folks that, that I know are also, also waiting for their copies. Uh, nothing says Christmas like a book about a massacre. So that's, that's right. Nice. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Give it to your friends and neighbors. <laughs> We're already depressed enough. So let's read. Let's read it it's, it's, it's an interesting story. You know, like uh, I knew some about, you know, the, the atrocities and, and the and how, you know, the land in Ohio was, you know, between Americans and the British and, and these these tribes are caught in the middle, but didn't do anything really specific about this. So it's 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 well done and I, I really enjoyed it and look forward to getting a hard copy. Um, what's next for you? I think I, I hopefully I know what's next, but Dude, you can tell everybody what what you may be working on now. I finally got, I've gone back to George Rogers Clark where I started. <laughs> And hopefully that that uh, working on a project for him for ERW about him for ERW uh, we've got a manuscript uh, not quite finished um, because the COVID killed some of my travel plans to go out and visit some of the sites associated with his Illinois campaign um, and uh, so he's he's sort of my next my next large project uh, I got a little side project I'm working on John Rutledge um, okay great. For, Governor of South Carolina, mm -hmm. but that's not going to be as, as big. It's always good to have more than one project. Mark's got like eight. <laughs> <laughs> Mark and I. Mark, Mark and I had manuscripts due uh, three weeks ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're still working on that timeline, right, Mark? <laughs> But as you said, COVID has kind of slowed down publishing. So we've, we've, we've been given a little bit of reprieve on our deadline, but we probably should get to it. So, um, Mark, do you have anything else? No, thank you uh, for talking to us. Uh, like I said, I, I haven't had the opportunity to read it yet, but I'm looking forward to uh, yeah, being able to read about it. I do think it's a really interesting uh, aspect of the Revolutionary War, something that I think the, the Western theater doesn't get as much... Uh, attention as uh, the stuff in the east so um, sure. I think it's I think it's and I think it really highlights yeah just how brutal and uh, um, you know bloody the revolution really was um, so I'm 
excited to, and I'm glad that you're trying to looking at, you know, I also think that massacres in general kind of bring up obviously very strong emotional reactions. Right. Um, so I think trying to take a nuanced approach and trying to look at it from multiple perspectives is, uh, is a great way to try and, uh, I, I like the subtitle, was it anatomy of a massacre to try mm -hmm. and dissect this and look at it uh, from every possible way not to just get that emotional reaction, but to understand uh, what occurred uh, and why it occurred. So. <laughs> Not to credit the publisher for the title because mine sucked. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> uh, all right, well, well, thank you, Eric. And um, everybody else, we will be back here. Actually, we have a special th Thanksgiving uh, evening program we'll be putting on. So if you are not sleeping from Turkey or not watching football, um, you know, check us out here on social media. We have a, a short uh, little uh, presentation on George Washington's Thanksgiving proclamation. And then we'll have our happy hour next Sunday night um, at seven o'clock here. Um, here on uh, ERW social media pages. But Mark, tell us what's going on in December since you're kind of running our December program list here. Yeah, so we're working uh, in December 13th, which is uh, the day before the anniversary of uh, George Washington's death. Uh, we're going to have uh, Peter Henriquez, uh, who just came out with a recent biography on George Washington. So we're going to talk to him about that book. Uh, yeah, they're first and always, which uh, I'm working my way through right now. It's excellent. It's uh, great. And he's really the expert also on Washington's death. So uh, being able to talk to him right at that time will be great. Um, and then uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking 10 crucial days uh, right there between Christmas and New Year's uh, during the actual anniversary of the 10 crucial days. My favorite topic. So <laughs> and Mark and I are hoping to go up to Princeton in January, COVID willing. <laughs> yeah. So, so thanks again, Eric. I appreciate it. Everyone, thank you. Um, hope everyone has a great uh, Thanksgiving and be safe. We'll see you next week. Thank you.